Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, St. John's Church. Good morning. It's great to see you out this morning. What a gorgeous day we have before us today. I'm Pastor Lane Miller Visum and just delighted to see your shining, bright, happy faces this morning. For those of you who are worshiping online, I can't see yours, but I hope that you'll know how much we're glad you're here with us as well. We've come together today to exalt and lift up Jesus Christ. That's our primary purpose. But we also come as the family of God to exhort and encourage and strengthen one another on our faith journey. So we pray that this will be that for you. I invite you as the candles are lit and the music plays to quiet your heart today and allow the Spirit of God who is in this place to speak to your heart as we prepare to worship together. to the songs as they're played on the musical instrument, but I love that part where it says, and now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. And that's because of all that God has done for us. What a great day to be together. This is Pentecost Sunday, and so we rejoice and celebrate in the Holy Spirit and the coming on that day of Pentecost and the birth of the church that day. Um, we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But for now, we stand and join in the call to worship. It's on the screen and in your bulletin. The day of Pentecost has come, and we are together. Surely God is in this place. The works of God surround us. Listen, look. The Spirit of God fills us with amazement. God sets us afire with wonder and awe. We will sing to God as long as we live. We will celebrate the gifts of God. And let's sing together, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
screen for our unison prayer. Ever living and ever loving God, we praise you for your loving presence with us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill your church, that our worship will be ever more pleasing to you, that our prayers will change our minds instead of trying to get you to change yours, and that our lives will make a real difference to the real people in the real world. Amen. We invite you before you're seated to turn around and greet the signs of greeting and peace those around you. <laughs> Just a couple, well, I think one <laughs> opportunity for you, and that's coming up on June 19th. The Sunday School Picnic will be held at noon that day. We will have worship together here at 915 on June 19th, and what? It'll be my last day with you. Um, but we will celebrate together at noon at the pavilion, so we invite you all to bring a dish. There's no sign-ups or anything for that, right? It's just come as you are and bring something to share. That's what I'm guessing. We'll find out next week if that was wrong. Um, but I wanted to let you know also that the Past week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we attended, Bob and I attended the United Methodist Annual Conference for the Susquehanna Conference that was held in Hershey, and it was a good time. Um, so it was uh, overseen, presided by Bishop um, Sandra Steiner Ball, and she did an excellent job not only with the business portion of uh, the conference, but also with the worship and just a, a really loving spirit of God. There was unity in that place and what could have been maybe a little bit tense and a little bit, um, you know, whatever that means, you know, a little bit not unified uh, was not there. There really was the spirit of God was very present as we all packed in, all about a thousand of us, maybe 1,200 um, into the room and discussed um, just the important matters of the church and the future of the church and um, just really seeking God's will and God's face for uh, unity uh, in spite of what may come in a couple of years with amicable separation. So I did want to report just that little piece. Bernita was our well, is our lay leader to conference for this year and so she also attended and she'll be writing up a report and sharing with you um, just more of what was so meaningful to her in that so we look forward to hearing more from Bermuda. I remind you that our offering is being collected at the doorway and um, that is something that everybody can participate in whether you're coming or going uh, or if, if you're worshiping online, you're certainly welcome to mail that in so that we can support and continue to generously support the mission and ministry of St. John's Church. We knew, move now into sharing our joys and concerns. And as I was sitting here missing people, um, I'm wondering if anyone has any updates on uh, uh, maybe Ron and Louise or uh, Sue McMullen or Bill um, and Barb. Anybody know any more than I know? Uh, prayers for Louise. She had an issue the other day with her back. Okay. All right. Continue to pray for those that I mentioned, but especially Louise. She had an issue with her back, and um, pray that she finds relief from that. Are there new joys or new concerns that you would like to share? You don't have to be shy just because we have guests today. <laughs> I would like to share, I just uh, opened the mail right before church, and there is a note from Caleb, who was with us a couple of weeks ago. Um, friends at St. John's, thank you. I'm reading it to you because his penmanship is a little challenging. <laughs> Caleb, if you're listening out there, sorry, buddy. Don't mean to throw you under the bus, but I will post this on the bulletin board. Friends at St. John's, thank you so much for your recent special gift toward my missionary role at Joyelle. 
and allowing me to come and preach it was a joy to meet many of you i hope to be able to come again soon i long for your prayers as i plan for cia next year many people need the truth of god's word they need the love only jesus can bring i'm thankful i can be a part of that remember you are not alone god has a great work for each of you to do i love that that closing and then Caleb puts a scripture passage here. So <coughs> just um, encourage you to continue to pray for Caleb as well as for the CIA ministry. And if God so leads, they will be meeting again, I believe on Wednesdays um, next year at Park Avenue Church. It's a great opportunity to um, speak into the lives of teenagers. And those that have been involved have also been blessed. As we know, when we're giving of ourselves to the Lord's service, always comes back to you in bountiful ways. So I encourage you in that. As we come to praying together, will you sing with me just the chorus, ladies, I don't know if I made that clear, just the chorus of Through It All. that you would um, 
as they do so well. Help them to once again receive with grace and love Pastor Bruce. I pray that in the transition, Lord, that the thing that he brings to the life of this church would be the very thing that is so desperately needed. We're not even sure what that is, but we pray that you would empower and equip Pastor Bruce as he leads the Chambersburg circuit. And we pray that too, that our, um, that our commitment to you won't be dependent on who the, is leading the charge, but that our commitment always will be to you, Lord Jesus, the head of the church, and that we would stay faithful to you and uh, in our generosity, in our giving, in our giving of time and talents and treasures, um, in our family commitment and for holding one another in prayer, that you would be honored to you all glory and honor. And so we ask that in this transition time that you would guide and you would direct. All of this and so much more we ask from the depths of our hearts in the name of Jesus the Christ who taught us when we pray to say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil the light is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> How appropriate that on this day of Pentecost, when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, that we would have a guest speaker who is coming to share with us about people on the other side of the world. Remember what happened at Pentecost? Not only did the Holy Spirit come with flames of fire and, and with power, but he emboldened the people to speak in languages that they didn't know so that all the people that were there heard in their own language the truth of the gospel. I think it's powerful as we come to this time to learn about India that this day God knew in advance would come on the day of Pentecost when Reverend Bill Tate would be with us to share his heart about uh, Glad Tidings India. And so I encourage you, so it was about 20 years ago, maybe 22, oh my goodness, I was only 10, but <laughs> Bill came <laughs> into um, Audubon Church where I was on staff and I had the privilege of meeting him. We did a project called the Rice Bag Project and everyone had a little bag that they set on their kitchen table and your extra change would go in there, you know, and that was a day when we actually used money. <laughs> you know, now everything's like credit cards or Venmo, the kids are using, whatever, but you would have change at the end of the day and you would put it in and then at the end of that year, we all brought our rice bag projects and had uh, bags in and dumped them out into a grand celebration. So that was how I first met Bill Tate and uh, so when he found out I was a pastor contacted me and said we got something new for you would your people be interested in absolutely these people love Jesus and they love God's world so would you give a warm welcome to Reverend Bill Tate and his wife Lane <laughs> yes you heard me <laughs> well it's good to be with you today and, and actually I've come to give each one of you the opportunity to bring the gospel to a people who've never heard it before. These people have never heard the name of Jesus. They're slaves of depravity, or slaves to the old nature. They have no hope for this life, and they certainly have no hope for life after death. I want to read a few verses from the scripture as the basis for the message this morning reading from Romans chapter 10 uh, beginning with verse 8 but what does it say 
The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This morning I want to ask the question, why should you and I be motivated to bring the gospel to people who have never heard it before? And I'm going to actually give you five reasons, so you can keep going along with me and know how we're progressing. But the first reason is this. Out of gratitude to God for simply being born or living in America, when we could have been born in so many other places in the world where life would be so much more difficult. And the fact is, you and I had nothing to do with where we were born. We could have been born in one of the villages where you can help bring the gospel to the for the first time. This is called the Chalit, the Chitur Delit and Abbasai village in Andhra Pradesh. I know that sounds like a strange name, but as I describe the living conditions, we're going to see some pictures of these. We're not talking about a couple hundred people over in a corner. This is 50,000 people and all over India. There are thousands, thousands of people that live in dire conditions that we can't even in America believe still exist today. Now these Chatur Dalit Adivasai live in one of the most backward districts in India. They live in a one-room hut, no electricity, no running water, and no toilets. Mm. Now I just want you to think about that for a minute. If you had to go to the bathroom, you didn't have a toilet. That's been my situation in India. That's not fun. Or no electricity. And it's hard for us to fathom. The villages are dirty and cause disease. They drink water from polluted wells. They don't know any better. That's their only source of water. They're ignorant regarding health and hygiene, just basic things you want to do to keep clean and well. They don't know. <coughs> the literacy rate is 35%. That means if there are 100 people here, 35 would be able to read and write. The others, 65 would not. These people are treated as untouchables. That means in India, they're below the caste system. They're really not looked upon as human beings. They lack food when no work is available. Women are often harassed and abused. Men cheat on their wives. Children drop out of school to work. They're made to work at an early age. They are very superstitious. That means you're scared of everything. Very superstitious. They believe in black magic, animal sacrifice. They have no hope for a God, no knowledge of a God who loves them. And my point is this, you and I could have been born in one of these villages, but for the grace of God. Instead, we were born in one of the most affluent nations in the world, and in my opinion, at the best time to be born here. We have really been blessed. Um, the Pew Research Center said that 71% of the world's population <coughs> earns $10 or less per day. So how should we respond? My Colossians 3.15 says be thankful. And I, I've often said this, I believe that everyone in America should be in church on Sunday morning if for no other reason than just to be thankful that we're here. We have it so good compared to so many people. It's unbelievable. But there's a second way that we can respond. And I want to read out of Deuteronomy chapter uh, 8 verses 10 and 11. 
When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. Well, that's going to church and praising God. Verse 11, though, says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. How do we forget God? Failing to observe his commands. And I believe one of the greatest commands that we have is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's that's really the whole purpose of the church. That's that's excuse me. That's why we exist, that others may know Christ. So my first reason as to why we should be motivated to really reach others with the gospel is because that's the way we show God that we have not forgotten him. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A second of my five reasons that I want to share with you this morning is that in our ministry, the hard work is being done by Indian Christians. You and I are not being asked to go into these villages and keep in mind they are filthy, there's all kinds of diseases. <coughs> it's dangerous. There's a lot of places in India where people can be put in jail or even killed for talking about Jesus. I am so impressed with the Indian Christians that I have met and known over the years. Their commitment to Christ is tremendous. And they're willing to go into these very difficult places and share the faith. All that you and I are really being asked to do is to make it possible for them to go to provide the materials and the training so that they can they can bring the gospel to these people. So my second reason is the hard work is being done by others. A third reason we should be motivated to reach the unreached in India is because as Christians we need to be concerned for the poor. Ezekiel 16:49 says now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. We have actually a three-year uh, strategy for reaching unreached people groups in India. And the first year, Bible-based literacy classes are conducted for 450 adults. Most of the people in the unreached people groups that have never heard of Jesus are illiterate, and often over 80%. They're very poor. They're daily wage laborers who go out to the fields, and if there's work that day, they work and get paid. If there's no work, they get home and don't get paid. Due to poverty, they don't have adequate food and water, and unfortunately, there's a alcohol problem with a lot of these people and it just keeps them in that cycle of poverty. But in the first year of our strategy for reaching unreached people groups, we have a literacy program where they not only are taught to read and write, and when you can read and write and write and you can't, you're in a whole new world. But they're also taught self-help skills so that they can learn how to generate additional income. And um, I hope you pick up on my sarcasm. It's not like in America where we just give people money. They're taught to work and help themselves. And so in our literacy program, for example, uh, uh, there's this Udgir tribals in the Maharashtra Strait where the, the people there, no source of income. They didn't have regular salaries. They didn't have regular jobs. Uh, the men were daily wage laborers, and the women worked in construction carrying bricks and stones. They were paid $1.50 a day, the women. But in our literacy program, 450 adults go through that literacy classes the first month. Of those 450, 32 learned to set up tea stalls. 63 started ve uh, vegetable and fruit stands. So they could sell vegetables and fruits. 39 learned tailoring, so they would sew things and make a little income. 125 women started to generate income. They do all kinds, they start, make tooth powder, soap powder, just all kinds of basic things they are taught. So what I love about the literacy program is that 
They not only learn to read and write, but they are taught how to work. They're taught some skills so they can help themselves. And in addition to that, as they practice their reading, they learn about um, basic health and personal hygiene, like how to keep your water pot clean, you said, you know, get sick, or nutrition and proper diet, how to grow green vegetables in your garden and eat more nutritiously, family relationships, sanitation, uh, government programs for the poor. India has a lot of good government programs for the poor, but if you're illiterate, you don't know about it. So I love the fact that the first year of our three-year strategy can uplift every dimension of people's lives in the name of Jesus and as they learn about Jesus. A fourth reason I think we should be motivated to really reach those who don't know Christ is because those who don't know Christ are lost in this life. They're under the bondage of sin, they're slaves to the depraved or old nature. Second Timothy 2.26, the Apostle Paul says regarding those that oppose the gospel, that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Second Peter 2.19, the Apostle Peter says that false teachers promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a person is a slave to whatever has mastered him. In these unreached people groups, I can't believe the living conditions. In the last 12 years, I've written up descriptions of over 130 unreached people groups. To put it bluntly, they live like animals. They treat each other not as human beings. It's how can people act like this? Well, I'll tell you exactly why they act like this. Christ has never come into their life. They don't have a Bible. They don't know what's right and wrong. They just go by their old nature. So in many of these unreached people groups, uh, men have two or three wives. Women are beaten and abused. Children are given alcohol to drink when they're just kids. Illicit affairs are common. Girls are married at age 15 or 16. All kinds of things. The Romans 1.28 says, you know, how can people live like this? Here's the answer. Romans 1.28 and 29. He gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Left to our old nature, which all of us have. Why did you act the way you did yesterday? All of us have that old nature. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit to help us to be what God wants us to be, we are really in trouble. And that's a great reason for bringing the gospel to these people, because they can be freed from the bondage of the old nature. John 18, 32, Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I don't know about you, but I love being set free. I hate acting the way I don't want to act. John 8, 36, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Then the fifth and final reason I believe you should be motivated to help bring the gospel to these people, and you can do that today, is because their eternal destinies are being changed. We've had our three-year strategy completed in 130 unreached people groups. And these are people who've never heard the name of Jesus. They're living in these horrible conditions. They're depraved. We frequently see in three years 800 decisions for Christ, 150 baptized, and 1,000 attending churches in three years. It's been incredible. We work with a partner organization in India that's all Indian, India Bible Literature, and Bailey was the head of that. I've known him for many, many years. And in some of these places, we've just seen incredible response to the gospel. I said, Bailey, how do you explain such a response to the gospel? He said, it's easy. He said, they have never heard before that there's a God who loves them. They have never heard before about heaven, that they have a place to look forward to when they die. And you think if you've never, ever heard that before, that's a great reason for responding.
So why should we be unmotivated to reach the unreached? First of all, simply out of gratitude to God for where we live, being born here. Secondly, the hard work is being done by the Indian Christians. We're just asked to help to provide the training and the materials. Thirdly, we're commanded to help the poor. Fourthly, the unreached are slaves of depravity and need to be set free. And fifth, eternal destinies are being changed. Our program is indigenous in nature, which means it's done by Indian Christians. And when you can have an indigenous program, it's the least expensive program you can have. We can take one person through the literacy classes, two hours a night, five nights a week, for 10 months for $25. But in our strategy to reach unreached people groups, we try to have 450 go through the classes the first year. So $25 isn't much, but 450 times $25 is $11,250. The second year, we train 12 church planters to begin planting churches. And the third year, we have literacy classes for another 300 adults because now churches are started and people must be able to read the Bible. But then we reach out to families by having vacation Bible school for uh, 1,000 children. And so our, our strategy for reaching unreached people groups is inexpensive on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's quite expensive. Really, over the three years, it's over $30,000. And in the early part of going, what happened, I'll give you a background quickly. In 2010, Operation World did a study of 250 countries and they came out with a conclusion of all the unreached people groups in the world with 10,000 or more people, 75% of people who've never heard the name of Jesus were found in one country, and that was India. So we put together this three-year strategy 12 years ago and uh, to, reach, to particularly reach the unreached people in India. And in the early years, we had big churches involved we uh, had some individuals give. But I grew up in a little country Methodist church. I love small <coughs> country Methodist churches. And I thought, why couldn't we have small churches involved in the opportunity to bring the gospel to people for the first time? And so I was visiting with a pastor out in Everett, Pennsylvania. You know where that is off the Breezewood exit? Kind of a mountain town. And he said he had been there for 30 years. His name was Bob Robertson. And he was on the board of a, an orphanage in Gettysburg. And he said, as a member of the board, they were supposed to raise significant money for a new building for this orphanage. And he said, you know, in most churches, there's a couple of people who have money in every church. He said, in my church in Everett, 185 people on Sunday morning, there is not one person who has significant wealth. So he said, I went to my adult Sunday school class and I said, would you just put aside a dollar a day for the next three years? And the people love the pastor. He's been there 30 years. So it spread to the whole church. And in three years, people putting aside a dollar a day, he said, we raised thousands of dollars for this new orphanage. So you have to understand, I'm not too swift. It took me two weeks. I went home, laying in bed on one morning. I woke up and I thought, I wonder how many people it would take putting aside a dollar a day for just one year to underwrite that whole three-year strategy for reaching an unreached people group. When I did the math, I was shocked. 88 people. And I thought, you know, you could have three or four small churches make up to 88 people, 10 here, 20 there. I could give every church I go to, no matter what its size, the opportunity to bring the gospel to people for the first time. And so when Velu, uh, who directs our work in ministry, visited our home once, he brought us a gift, a silk tie for me and a little silk purse for my wife. And as I woke up that morning, I thought, what about people could put their dollars in. And I said, Lane, where's that? Lane, my wife, not Lane, the pastor. And I said, Lane, where is that silk purse made again? And I, she found it, and look, look, a dollar fits in it perfect. 
And so the idea is, and this is the challenge before you today, will you take one of these silk purses, each one of you, put on your <coughs> breakfast table, put in a dollar a day each day, and each month bring it in, collect it, and we'll send it to India, and see if you can't play a major part in reaching people in India with the gospel. You know, when I thought of this, actually the guy gave me the idea, I thought about my dad. My dad died in 1999, 93 years old. And when I was a kid, he had his own business, I rode with him. And when I was, for a reward, for riding with him that day, you know what he gave me? A York peppermint patty. <laughs> no, that big ones? You know what they cost? A nickel. Went to the grocery store the other day where the cash registers, your peppermint patties, they still have them. A dollar. A piece of candy. A dollar. I remember when my dad and I used to stop at a gas station and get a dollar's worth of gas. Wow. If dad came back to life today and I took him into a gas station and filled the tank, I think he'd die all over again. <laughs> It's only been in recent years we've had cell phones. I love my cell phone. They are so good. But they're costly. What is a dollar compared to what we pay for cell phones? Or for example, where I grew up, have any of you heard of Longwood Gardens? Is that familiar to any of you? I grew up eight miles from Longwood Gardens. When I was a kid, it was free. It's owned by the pond company. And then they started charging a dollar to get in. You know what it is today? To get into Longwood Gardens? $25. And they had to build an extra parking lot because so many people were coming and nobody comes by themselves. I mean, a dollar today is really nothing. So <coughs> I thought of that and I thought, boy, if we can bring the gospel to people in India for such a small amount, why not do it? And I've been sharing this with it's work great. I've been sharing with churches, it's wonderful. So today I ask you, would you take a purse, set aside a dollar a day for the next year? and help bring the gospel to the Chachur, Dalit, Adivasai people in India. Thank you very much. Would you lead us in prayer to just for this? Absolutely. You know, as Bill was talking, I thought about this. How do you eat an elephant? big huge elephant how do you eat that guy a bite at a time and that's what this dollar day project seems like to me like he's talking about a three years from now i don't even know where i'm going to be three years from now this is not a three-year project your dollar a day that goes into your silk purse every month we suggest that you take it out write a check for 30 or 31 dollars um, Norma has agreed to be the overseer for this project here at St. John's Church. And all that you need to do is take your little card, write your name and your email address. This is not going to Glad Tidings India. They don't know who particularly is participating from St. John's Church. Give that to Norma and she'll get a stack of cards and she'll make an email database and she will support and encourage you with timely reminders about um, participating in this and your participation in it. But I remind you, my friends, it is 100% voluntary. There's no expectation. That's why we're gonna pray. Because when Bill shared the project with me and <coughs> reminded me that in the Chambersburg circuit, we, Park Avenue St. John's Church, are the only church that is designated for this unreached people group whose name I can't even pronounce. I would love it to roll off my tongue like that. But we, this is who God has called for this particular people. And yeah, when you think about a dollar a day, it really is nothing. So let's pray. Our Father, Bill has shared not only this passion, this need with us, 
but has pointed us repeatedly to your word who says that we are to care for the widows and the orphans and those who are poor. It's so easy to forget that far away in another part of the world that people need Jesus. We see the needs around us. We see the needs, we pray for the needs in our nation and around the world. But we are currently being given an opportunity to actually do something that is going to make a difference. So Spirit of God, as you came on that day of Pentecost, as you poured out your peace and your power and your presence on the people of those first days, would you now come and stir in our hearts to respond obediently to this opportunity that's been given to us. Remind us, O oh Lord, that while we can't do everything, we can do one thing. And I pray that this would be a blessing for the people of St. John's Church, for the Chambersburg Circuit, as new things are about to begin on July 1. May this year be a year when they see your blessing being poured out because they have responded obediently. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Excuse me, I just have a couple questions. Yes. When did the project start? This, per <laughs> this particular project, when did it begin? It didn't start yet, August. What? It started in August. A everywhere, everywhere that you've gone and... Now this particular group, ministry is starting in August. Oh, starting in August. Right, so okay. July, all of July, you'll put your dollar in this particular one. But when did, when have you seen results in the rest of India? When you go to churches and when, how long have you been talking? 2010. 2010. 10, 10, 12 years. 12 years. Okay, and I'm just curious again, um, are you seeing any improvement in their basic living conditions? Absolutely. Your, oh. You will get a report after the first year of changes that we see in this particular group. How they're paying more attention to hygiene, sanitation in the villages, preparing their food, drinking clean. You'll get a detail. One of the I love about our ministry is you get a report of what's happening. Well, I just wanted to see how things were improving. Right. They really are. Okay. Yeah. And is there a lot more indigenous people out there that need to be uh, right? Per, um, yeah. That need to, that need the same project. Right, I'm right. sure there are yeah. more. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are more oh, people here. Yep. Yeah. No question. Can you say it one more time, very slowly, for us? Chitour. Chitour. Delete Adavasi. Chitur. Delete. It's almost like speaking Greek. Let's try it together. Chitur. Delete Adavasi. Adavasi. Okay. Um, in, we won't even keep on going to Andhra Pradesh. <laughs> but in India. Okay. Are there any other questions before we sing together? I appreciate the your ladies. questions, by the yeah, way. Yeah, the it's ladies great. can come up. <laughs> well, we will be available for about eight and a half minutes <laughs> if you wanted to talk to him personally. And then, of course, Norma will be. Norma, would you move over to that uh, pew beside Susie and just have the, the purses ready? Okay. Well, I do encourage you to talk to Bill if you have any other questions. And now I invite you to stand as we sing, Christ for the world we sing. It's number 568, the words will also be on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Christ in your own little world, and may our worlds be broadened to share Christ with the world. Go in peace. Thank you.